I stand before you today to announce my candidacy for President of the United States. On January 21st, Kamala Harris announced she was running for president in 2020. Now, more than a month later, she's emerged as one of the Democratic Party's frontrunners. However, she's currently facing strong criticism, especially for her career as a tough-on-crime prosecutor in California. But between her Senate win in 2016 and her announcement to seek the presidency in January, she started to support measures in line with the progressive agenda figures like Bernie Sanders and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez have advanced. From tackling bail reform to supporting the Green New Deal to even backing Medicare for All, Harris is taking positions that past establishment candidates like Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama wouldn't have taken. So where does she really stand? My sense of her has always been that she was someone who, who certainly had an eye on higher office. Um, and the road that she wanted to take to that was to be a, a tough prosecutor. Branko Marchetic, a contributor to Jacobin Magazine, who wrote one of the most extensive profiles of Kamala Harris back in 2017, says that Harris's recent progressive rhetoric is a form of compensation for a lifetime of enacting tough-on-crime policies Democratic voters no longer think are fair. And so basically the piece that I wrote was looking at uh, how much her current rhetoric really aligns with her, um, with her past policies. Uh, the answer being uh, not all that much. Having gone their political education in the 90s and the 2000s, which is the kind of high point of uh, democratic centrism and the, the third way, um, her politics are very much of that uh, era. The way that, that you win, the way that you defeat uh, the right is by basically trying to triangulate and take some of their positions so you can peel off right-wing voters. Marchetich argues that Harris's whole career has been a balancing act between garnering popular support and gaining the trust of the establishment. And the first stark example of that was in 2004, when she had just been elected as district attorney of San Francisco and had refused to seek the death penalty for a man who had killed a police officer. It was a stance for which she was heavily criticized, including by U.S. Senator and former San Francisco Mayor Dianne Feinstein. In later years, however, it was something she really didn't speak about or continue to challenge, even though she ran on an anti-death penalty platform. In fact, 10 years later, she reversed her position and even appealed a federal judge's conclusion that the death penalty was unconstitutional. Her explanation was that while she was personally opposed to capital punishment, her job as a prosecutor was to enforce the will of the voters, the majority of whom had voted for the death penalty. That explanation might have been plausible if it weren't for the fact that in 2008, California faced the same exact situation with regards to banning gay marriage. And a battle that's too close to call is over the future of same-sex marriage. As with the death penalty, voters had approved a ban on gay marriage in the state. And again, as with the death penalty, a federal judge later ruled that referendum to be unconstitutional. I think that Prop 8 is, um, as the court has declared, unconstitutional. However, and Harris you know, chose not to defend the referendum on banning gay marriage. Think about it conceptually, it's just wrong. Proving that she was indeed selective on which issue she was willing to fight for. Which I think was a, a very obvious kind of play, I think, for her later Senate run. You know, it was, it was um, her showing, feeding something to the Democratic base, which at that time was, I think, a lot more occupied with something like Proposition 8 and, and uh, gay rights, uh, as they rightly should have been. But, but I think there was less uh, talk about criminal justice reform. The fact that she refused to seek out the death penalty um, when she was under a lot of uh, political pressure when she first came in um, as, uh, as DA, I think, is, uh, is, is definitely a good thing. But the fact that she continued to defend it after, I think, shows the, um, uh, the limits of how far someone like her can really especially if they wanted to get ahead politically, how far they can really buck the system. I suspect, I should say, that perhaps, perhaps that could have been a, um, a sort of learning uh, experience for her where she, she got this tremendous amount of criticism for refusing to uh, put this man to death. And so she then later on had to sort of prove that, no, no, no she, you know, she's not going to be someone who, who follows through on her, her anti-death penalty principles and power. She's going um, she's gonna to hold to uh, what the law is. After the death penalty controversy in 2004, Kamala Harris becomes much more conservative. 
In the following years, she would help pass legislation that reported arrested undocumented juveniles to immigration and customs enforcement. It's been called the toughest law in America. So she would not only defend the three strikes law, which is a highly punitive law that puts someone behind bars for life if he or she simply commits both one violent felony and has two previous convictions, but Harris would also make her support for the law a centerpiece of her 2009 campaign for re-election. She actually ran to the right of her Republican opponent on that, who actually uh, wanted to uh, get rid of the three strikes law. She would fight to protect the practice of civil asset forfeiture, and more specifically the ability for police to seize profits before charges were even filed. She also famously fought to keep Daniel Larson, a man who was wrongfully convicted of burglary in 1999, in jail even after a judge reversed his conviction due to a lack of evidence. But the Daniel Larson case is basically uh, someone who um, was uh, arrested and, and convicted for something that he didn't do. Uh, mostly his offense was that he had a, a weapon, he was on probation and he had a, a, a knife on him. And, um, and the police found that. And uh, he, he had um, incompetent kind of legal representation. Um, he was in jail for a number of years and he ended up being freed by uh, a judge who decided that what had happened to him was manifestly unjust. And Harris appealed that. There was also the case of Kevin Cooper, a black man who was imprisoned in 1983 for a horrific mass murder incident in California. New DNA evidence could impact the future of an inmate who has been on death row for more than 35 years. After his trial and sentencing, however, new evidence came out suggesting the police had maybe framed Cooper. But despite Cooper's petitions for a revisitation of the case, Kamala Harris's office objected. Cooper is still in prison today, but with renewed pressure, California Governor Gavin Newsom has finally ordered new DNA testing. Now, Newsom wants current DNA tests done on hair, blood, and fingernail scrapings. It was only after an explosive New York Times investigative report that Harris publicly supported the new DNA testing in a Facebook post, but failing to acknowledge that she had been a barrier to the testing in the past. There was also... The I think something that's kind of come onto the fore a little more in recent uh, months is her policy of prosecuting truant, uh, well, the parents of truant kids as, as a sort of uh, back to school <laughs> encouragement policy, except that, you know, instead of using a, a carrot, it's using a, a, a very punitive one, stick. A friend of mine actually called me and he said, Kamala, my wife got the letter. She freaked out. She brought all the kids into the living room, held up the letter, said, if you don't go to school, Kamala's going to put you and me in jail. Basically, she, she wanted to threaten parents with jail if their kids didn't turn up to school, which obviously is a policy that is going to um, disproportionately affect um, uh, uh, minority communities. Um, the same minority communities that she is, I think, trying to now appeal to and present herself as something of a champion. Uh, for. Even as late as 2013, Harris continued not only to defend her tough-on-crime philosophy, but make fun of the emergent movement against the crisis of mass incarceration. We all have these posters in our closet that is attached to a stick. She, uh, she's on stage and she kind of mocks this kind of this activist impulse, the uh, less prisons, more schools. And we run around with these signs, build more schools, less jails. Build more schools, less jails. And we walk around everywhere. Build more schools. We protest. Build more schools, less jails. She, she does it in this very kind of like very mocking way um, where the idea is that the, the, these people, these activists are not serious. There's a fundamental problem with that approach, in my opinion. And it's this. I agree with that conceptually. But you have not addressed the reason I have three padlocks on my front door. You know, she talks about how we all, we all have these... Uh, placards in our closets. You know, we all used to be activists, but you know, if you really want to be in the real world, you want to be a serious person. Um, you have to forget that kind of soft-headed nonsense. And you know, the 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 way to go is by really um, prosecuting people. So part of the discussion about reform of criminal justice policy has to be an acknowledgement that crime does occur. I mean, that that's not really smart on crime, and I would say that that's not even a realistic thing. That that's a a fantasy, the idea that you can just keep locking people up and, and solve anything. Um, it's a fantasy that is driven by political considerations. Um, because that, for her, for someone of her generation, um, that was seen as the, uh, the ticket to political power, was to show that you were tough. 
Similarly, she mocked her Republican opponent for supporting the legalization of marijuana a year later in 2014 during the race for Attorney General of California. My position is it needs to be legalized. Ron Gold, the Republican candidate for Attorney General, wants to tax and regulate the use of marijuana for recreational purposes. Colorado is already beginning to prove to everybody that there is sufficient taxable base. We asked California's current top cop, Kamala Harris, for her position on this controversial issue. Your opponent, okay. Ron Gold, has said that he is for the legalization of marijuana recreationally. Your thoughts on that? Um, I that he is entitled to his opinion. <laughs> she laughed at the idea. That was a that was her reaction. She she laughed um, because it was such a ridiculous idea. Now uh, she's asked about um, smoking pot on um, uh, on the Breakfast Club. So there are a lot of reasons why we need to legalize. Have you ever smoked? I have. Okay. Like and I and I inhale. I didn't. I did inhale. To me, it's uh, the height of hypocrisy to, to now be bragging um, about using drugs uh, illegally, while uh, refusing to even countenance the idea of legalizing that drug. Um, when so many people being um, having the book thrown at them by the criminal justice system. The contradictions in Harris's record touch other issues as well. In 2011, for example, she was lauded when she reached a $25 billion settlement with two big-to-fail banks for their roles in the 2008 subprime mortgage crisis. But she was also heavily criticized for not going as far as many say she should have. California was the epicenter of the crisis, and yet Harris made no effort to put even a single executive behind bars. And in 2017, The Intercept divulged a 2013 memo prosecutors from her office had sent her saying that it had, quote, uncovered evidence suggestive of widespread misconduct at One West Bank, where current Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin had been the CEO. Harris's office had actually advised her to go after Steve Mnuchin, uh, Steve Mnuchin's bank, One West, that had engaged in really, uh, like, flabbergasting criminality, um, uh, you know, basically really just stealing people's houses in, in many cases. Uh, and she did not do that. Um, who knows why? Uh, you know, as the intercept pointed out, Mnuchin um, or, or One West had donated to her. Whether that's why, or whether it's um, more to do with a sort of uh, caution or timidity to take on, um, you know, uh, moneyed interests, powerful moneyed interests, uh, it's it's hard to say at this point. On environmental issues, she's taken a similar approach. She has a strong track record when it comes to holding polluters accountable. And as DA in San Francisco, she created a team whose sole purpose was pursuing cases of illegal dumping and air pollution. But she's been reluctant to speak out and support the Green New Deal, supporting the idea of it, but not explicitly endorsing it. And I think we sort of see a similarity in that with her recent uh, comments on Medicare for All, where she at first said that, um, yes, uh, she was in favor of abolishing private insurance, and then uh, she got a wave of criticism from it, uh, for it, from the right and the Democratic Party, uh, and she immediately, very quickly backtracked on that. She said afterwards, you know, well, you know, Medicare for all, uh, single payer can mean a lot of things. It could mean a public option. It could mean um, this. It could mean that. Uh, I mean, which is not true. A public option and single payer are a very different thing. Basically, it's she, she, I think now, is sort of walking back a little bit from the Medicare for all vision that's outlined in the uh, Sanders bill and sort of saying, well, you know, it could be other things too. There could be a lot of ways that we get to single payer, which is um, not strictly true. <laughs> On foreign policy, Harris tends to be silent. But when she does speak up, she's nakedly hawkish. She's a strong apologist for Israel and spoke at APAC's conference last year, going so far as to compare the civil rights movement in Selma to Israel's struggle for nationhood today. It certainly seems like the donor base, uh, the large donor base that was supporting Clinton has, has migrated towards Kamala Harris. She did a fundraiser in um, Hollywood not too long ago where a, a bunch of Clinton donors, you know, these sort of entertainment moguls showed up to uh, to be there. In um, 2017, she was reported to be, um, to be uh, going to fundraisers with former Clinton donors in, um, in uh, Martha's Vineyard, I believe. Uh, you can definitely make the case that she's sort of, Harris is kind of the, uh, the torchbearer um, passed on from Hillary Clinton, you know, many of the same 
donors and, and um, establishment kind of uh, opinion is behind her. Kamala Harris is part of a camp of politicians in Washington who have built their credentials on the increasingly outdated idea that Democratic voters want tough-on-crime liberals in office. But it's clear Harris is struggling to switch gears and rework her image to appeal to the more progressive wing of the party that supported Bernie Sanders in the last elections. A recent poll even suggests that among black primary voters, Harris trails Sanders two to one. In the end, Harris, along with other establishment Democrats like Cory Booker and Joe Biden, seem to be frantically trying to salvage their political careers. Politicians like Harris, Biden, Booker, you know, they must feel like the rug has been pulled up. Harris, like uh, all these other politicians, are now scrambling to um, to 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 uh, make up for their their past records. But it's very hard to run away from your history, especially you know someone like Harris or someone like Biden. They they have uh, decades worth of of things they've done um, that now look very bad when inspected.